The open enrollment period for health insurance will only run November 1st to December 15th, so make sure you're covered for 2018 with a local carrier you can trust. Children's Community Health Plan, an affiliate of Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, offers Together with CCHP, a health insurance plan that includes a new catastrophic plan for individuals under the age of 30. Our plans give you access to high-quality health care from a broad network of providers in Southeast Wisconsin. Learn more at TogetherCCHP.org. Blog Talk Radio. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It would appear that I'm exactly five minutes behind schedule. Shocker, right? I know I'm always behind schedule. I try not to be, but I can't help it. It's like phone call to phone call, person to person, interview to interview, and the two people on my show today are phenomenal, and so I don't want to keep John on hold for very long. Just a couple quick announcements to remind everybody. Um, We have, obviously, John's interview right now. Right after him is Patty Hughes, who I'm so excited to be interviewing. She's one of my dear pals from New York City. Great new campaign she's starting, and that'll be at 2 o'clock Central Time. And then, of course, tomorrow, I don't want to forget, my last show up until the 27th of this month, because I'm taking a little time off. None other than Margaret Joseph of the Real Housewives of New Jersey will be on the show tomorrow at 1230 Central Standard Time. Big reminder to everybody, my dear friend Alyssa Stoll, who is, of course, on the Real uh, Real Estate Wars on Bravo TV. That's their new reality-type show for real estate in the OC. is going to be on at 9 o'clock tonight, so big shout-out to her. She's part of my calendar this year. Super, super excited. Take some time to go ahead and check out her show this evening if you can. I'd greatly appreciate it. I'm sure that she would as well. Um, also, don't forget to check out new updates on my film festival, Art is Alive Film Festival. Yolasite.com. Otherwise, the name Art is Alive Film Festival on Facebook as well. Also, all of you are going to be getting my invite. As you all know, uh, all of the finalists and the winners from my film festival are being put into a calendar, which I'm releasing for the Christmas holiday. That's going to be happening um, next month, as a matter of fact. So I'll send you an invite for the page. And, of course, I'm still looking for musicians and actors for my upcoming film, Love's Two-Way Mirror, which we're shooting next month. So without further ado, let's uh, stop having John Holt get him on the line and start our interview. Hi, John. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, Cindy. How do you ever have time to interview people with all of that going on? <laughs> well, that's just a glimpse of my life. That's not even everything. Oh, it's insane. No, no. Actually, interviewing people um, is one of my favorite things to do in the whole wide world because it's my show, so I get to talk any way I want. I'm in my pajamas right now. I'm not on a red carpet, so I can just hang Me out too. on my couch and talk to you. It's awesome. We're both in pajamas and comfortable, so this is very cool. I have a lot of questions for you. Um, you're a very interesting person. I, I've read your background. I've seen a bunch of different things about you. So I want to start off with something very generic, which I think is so cool. All of you people that come from Canada, I say this all the time, you're kind of beat with the beauty stick, meaning I've never seen an ugly person derived from Canada. So I want to know what the magic is there. What is it about Canada that makes you guys full of funk and free spirit, and you're all attractive. What's up with that? Well, attractive is internal, right, Cindy? Let's be clear. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, stop. Simple. You know what that means. Canada people are gorgeous. Yeah. They're just literally good-looking people. We've, it's, it's, it's fun to have a, a, you know, a, 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 a big kid next door you, you know, when you grow up because you, know, you, right. yeah, you always think a bit less of yourself for being, you know, uh, the, the little kid next door and um, you know so we have to be considerate of others because we you know are forced sort of to be considerate of you guys so <laughs> we've learned, we're kind of like the Irish right they've got the English next door. well the Irish, yeah, really, Irish. Nice, really I'm, you know I like the Irish I do. So and nice I like my Canadian other. well no and thanks, the thing thanks. is I, I'm not going to lie to you I mean I live in the United States obviously but I say this all the time that some of the best musicians and creative artists come from Canada, and, and I'm not embarrassed to say that. I, I think it's hugely impressive that yeah. your country has such a rich culture when it comes to those sorts of things, of course. Um, that's one of the things I want to ask you about. When you were younger, mm-hmm. did you always have that ability to be able to play guitar and, and to sing, or is that something that you had to kind of critique it and work on as you were aging? Well, yeah, you always, you know, I mean, I, you know, when, when, when you're doing something you love so much, it's hard to think of it as work, but I, I, I did stay at it. My aunt Martha showed me uh, what was in that funny shaped box, you know, that kind of roundish box. She showed me what was in there when I was about, you know, uh-huh. six or seven. And I decided, you know, I want to do that. <laughs> and she showed me, you know, the streets of Laredo. I think, I think it's actually called the Cowboy's Lament. As I walked out on the streets of Laredo, remember that? And uh, uh-huh. 
I just I just fell in love with the whole idea of uh, singing and you know reciting poetry and playing music and um, yeah. So I started when I was pretty young. My mom had me in piano lessons by the time I was about eight or nine. And by the time I was about uh, 12 or 13, I figured out that it was a lot easier to get dates with, you know, a guitar than a piano. So I made the big oh, jump. <laughs> That's cool. And, you know, I have a question relative to piano because I, I keep looking and I think I finally found a piano that I'm being gifted. And so I thought to myself, <laughs> you know, I'm almost 50 years old. I'm two years short of 50. And I'm thinking to myself at this age, am I just ridiculous for thinking that I could master something like this? Because from what I have heard, piano is not the easiest thing to play, is it? No, 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 that's not true at all. I think it's, uh, you know, really? I mean, uh, yeah, there's, um, there, there was a fellow, I'm trying to say, I'm scrambling for his name now, but he's, um, uh, he was a, a Polish fellow, he's an elder, he's quite famous, but he, he, he took up piano in his 60s and wound up, uh, he died at 96 or something like that, but he was a concert pianist when he died. So, keep, uh, wow. you know, God bless you, keep, keep going, you know, no, you know, you're good. All you have to do is you know, you play a little bit of guitar and then you figure out how the chords work in music, right? When you mm-hmm. play music, when you play piano, you read the music and you don't really understand how the music works. You, you just like, you know, put your fingers where the, where the boss tells you to put your fingers and then you play. <laughs> but if you play guitar, you learn where the chords are and then, then you figure out, well, I know if I can play C, F, and G, why can't I do that on a piano? And then you just make C, F, and G chords on the piano and then just wiggle your fingers. And the next thing you're playing a piano, just like you played your guitar, and you can play, you know, blowing in the wind on the piano. It's pretty simple. Oh yeah. my God, how cool is that? That sounds really neat. Yeah, yeah I'm excited. I'm, yeah, don't I, be I don't think I'm cool. It, you know? Don't don't I'm be crying. complicated about it. Guys, guys like Neil Young and Bob Dylan play piano, but they play actually very, very simply. You have to be musical. Uh, you don't have to be a virtuoso. So just be cool. Uh, be cool. I yeah, like that. Play, you know, cool. <laughs> okay, now here's an interesting twist. Now, um, before I get into your background in terms of educationally, I want to ask you the question because, of course, you're from Canada, and again, I'm in the United States, and I have a crow on my <laughs> beak today about this, so I'm like, you're Canadian, so let's talk to you about this a little bit. Um, obviously, you've derived from another country. Clearly, you live in the United States now, but I've been trying to figure out because I assume that you still have connections in Canada. So the big question, of course, has been, I'm always curious well, to ask people that derive from you now you, where's your current state where do you live now currently well actually uh, i to um uh, to be clear I, I don't live in the united states now i'm not permitted to come to your country i live in uh, salt spring island british columbia it's an island in the ocean that's what i thought Cooper and, yeah okay Nowhere, um, i gotcha. yeah, I was, I've lived in the united states i had places in malibu and you know i've, I've lived there but that's um, what I I'm, thought. um i'm 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 no longer permitted to be there because of this uh, rhubarb that I got in with Uncle Sam a few years back. Yeah, I presume that's that's coming up. Yeah. So now I, okay, so here's the question, because this will be perfect to ask you this, because I, and I'm pretty liberal when it comes to certain things. So I'm just trying to get, if you're comfortable with talking about it, I always ask people, okay, so what is your take on our, what I call our so-called president of the United States? I call him number 45 because I'm so frustrated with him. I can't stand it. So I'm always interested to get people from other countries just to get their opinion on a, their bird's eye view of what's happening here. You know, because obviously we have people in the United States that don't like them. We have all sorts of controversy about this. So we always like to, at least in my opinion, I want to know how other countries are viewing us in terms of our chosen leader. And, and there's no wrong answer to this. It's just an actual curiosity question by the host herself. Well, with all respect for the office of the president of the United States, you know, I just want to preface all this by saying, you know, <clears throat> once you have a look at my book, you, you see that um, I, there there probably is no bigger champion than the ideals upon which your country w- was built, and uh, there's no bigger champion of those ideals than me. And I think that, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I've, I have a tremendous, very, very deep respect for the ideals upon which your country was built. You know, equality, mm-hmm. e- e- equal, equal t- treatment before the law, all the rest of that stuff. Uh, sometimes you don't live yeah. up to it quite as well. As far as your, as far as uh, uh, Mr. Trump goes, I'm going to say um, the, the first thing I'll say is uh, I'm really really happy he's not bright. If he was bright, he'd be dangerous. You know, if you had President Steve Bannon, then I would be scared. But you know, <laughs> Trump is just he's too he's too impulsive to actually uh, to get, gather together the, the the power that is at his fingertips. You know, he's a uh, He's, he's way more at shoving power away from himself than he is the, holding it unto himself. But he's a disgrace. You know, he's a disgrace to your country, I think. And um, he's, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's brought out, um, 
he's brought out some qualities in, in your, we used to call them the religious right, but I don't think you can call them that anymore. I think you can just call them the right. <laughs> but, right. You know, he's, he's, he's shamed the hell out of those people. I think, you know, if you if you'd rather have a pedophile than a Democrat, I think you have to really uh, take another look at your, uh, at your uh, fundamental thinking. Right. So, yeah. um, yeah. All I can say is uh, I don't I don't like Trump's chances of making it through his presidency, and um, I think uh, you know mm-hmm. all of the uh, the generals that are around him probably run over to um, you know Mr. Mueller frequently and say, "Holy cow, what are we supposed to do?" And then Mueller probably says to them, "Take it easy, man. Go back and just keep a lid on it. We've got this." Mueller says, "We've got this, boys. Don't worry." <laughs> I think that's what's yeah. going on. Oh, yeah, definitely. I agree. Yeah, like I said, it's always interesting to ask other people and not necessarily because I want to, you know, have a show become an anti-bashing or or bashing this person or anti-this or anti-that. But, I, you know, obviously we live in a time where I think people like yourself are instrumental in keeping the positivity going, keeping us focused on things that we need to be focused on in terms of keeping our earth a better place, keeping souls being in a happier position. I think that's very, very important. Hugely important. So thank you for that. I'm very grateful for that remark. Thanks. Well, you're quite welcome. There'll be more to come, I'm sure. Um, Now, to tell the folks that haven't researched you, because obviously I have, you do have a law degree from the University of Calgary. So I have a question relative to that. Um, Mm -hmm. Do you use it? Because I was looking at your background, and I thought to myself, this is kind of odd. He went to pursue law, but he's not really an active lawyer. I understand you've been to the court system, so I'm thinking, well, it might have helped him there. But I'm like, what made you want to do that, or what made you do that, you know? Well, um, I guess I'm going to say uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the bottom line for me was I, I didn't have patience for mathematics and science when I was in high school. I I I go into them deeply now, but when I was a t- when I was a kid, I was a little less attentive, and so by the time um, I got into uh, university and got pregnant, the only uh, postgraduate uh, course that I could uh, achieve was law. <laughs> you oh know, my I God! Really? I could, <laughs> couldn't be a doctor because I didn't do do any chemistry. You know, I couldn't be you know like, you know a, a, a business guy because I wasn't you know very good at math. Uh, so yeah, same way. I just I needed a profession, and law came easily to me because all you had to do was be able to read. Oh my God, really? <laughs> <laughs> you got to be kidding me! Because I'm like, seriously, there's got to be a lot more work involved than that, right? I mean, at well, least well, four years quite... of studying, isn't it? Oh yeah, it's about seven actually. But there's a lot of work in whatever you do. Right? Mm. You know, has to you know well, everybody right. everybody no. has to work. So I'm not you know, but you know I think one of the things that I was interested to find out being a lawyer, uh, Cindy, was that um, in Canada anyways the um, the duration of a law career in private practice, you know, as compared to being a corporate lawyer or a government lawyer or whatever else, in Canada the, mm-hmm. the average is about seven years. So after about seven years, we wow. break away and get get into business, or we go work for a company, or we go uh, in, in, inside for a company, or we go you know inside for the government, or or, or teach you know academia, right. one of those things. But so I outlasted the average. I practiced law for about twelve or thirteen years before I broke away, before I achieved achieved escape velocity. And um, you know, I'm, I'm going to say about half of my friends who are lawyers really really love their jobs, and the rest of them pretend they do. Wow. Look at that. Yeah, well, you know, lawyers are not my favorite people in the world. It's like, you know what, they're a necessity, but it's just, you know, they a lot of times, depending on the genre, it's like, God, what a depressing job. I would hate it. I wouldn't be very good at that. I'm way too creative. I would be, like, totally not digging this whatsoever. So I just found that yeah, interesting. That's the way I felt. My God, look at that. Well, there you go. Now, um, you've had a couple of different paths in here. I know that you were the uh, founding director of the DSI, and for those of you that don't know what that stands for, it's actually David Suzuki Institute. So I want to talk a little bit about that and how you ended up branching off and and going into their direction and what made you want to collaborate with that particular organization. Well, I've been interested, you know, I'm, I'm, as as you can tell by the book, that I'm very interested in uh, the responsibility that we have for the natural bounty that has befallen us. Uh, and right. uh, Suzuki, of course, was a um, um, you know the kind of the preeminent uh, eco- e- ecologist um, in uh, in Canada when I was a kid. Um, he's not that much older than me, really, but you know, 15 years or something like that. But my very very good friend Jim Hogan and I were hippies together in the, in the 60s, you know. And um, and Jim uh, wound up being um, the uh, chairman of the board of the Suzuki Foundation and became good a friend of David's and. Um, 
when, uh, you know, Jim introduced me to uh, David and some opportunities to help, uh, when I, when, when all of that, you know, internet money fell in my lap, I had, I, you know, I was running around looking for places to get rid of it. And um, Suzuki came to the top of the list. And so we came, we became buddies and, uh, and I've been mm-hmm. helping him with his, uh, with his uh, undertakings ever since. And uh, I, I still do some work on for the, for the, for the board of the foundation, but the Institute is a different thing. It's a bit, um, the, um, the difference in Canada is that if you're a tax deductible charitable organization, you're not allowed to be in politics. You know, you have to stay out of politics and there's, there used to be a good reason oh. for that, but it's kind of sh- it's shadowed by something else now. But so what David and some mm-hmm. others were forced to do was to um, uh, start uh, other organizations that weren't tax deductible charitable organizations so that they could say what they think. You see what I'm saying? Oh, and I so do. So without, 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 without threatening their tax deductible status. Uh, and so, um, and David thought I would be a better candidate for the organization, the part of his organization, organization that could say what it thinks as compared to the one that had to, you know, bite their lip. And so okay. he honored me by asking, asking me to sign up. And uh, and I've been, you know, I speak with David now frequently about his um, public pronouncements and uh, what he should say and what mm-hmm. he shouldn't say. I'm I'm honored that he, you know. One of the things he used to, you know, he he used to say, these fucking conservatives, excuse me, I shouldn't say that out loud on the radio, but he'd say something like that. And they'd say, David, you can't say that because, you know, half of those people that you have just insulted, you know, agree with you on the climate thing. They just don't agree with you on the, on the political governance sort of thing, right? So you can't mm-hmm. be saying that, you know, well, you're not going to get anywhere if you alienate half of those, that, those people that actually you, they're the people you need most on your side. You know, so you can't be saying that. And then, but that's not the hard part, David. The hardest part is you can't be pumping the NDP. The NDP, the New Democrat Party in Canada, is sort of our most left-wing uh, federal party. And um, mm-hmm. you know, at the same at the same time, you know, these, so you've got all the people in the centrist. So if you're, you know, if you're if you're pumping one side of politically, um, you can't uh, you, you can't uh, you're you're alienating uh, all, all the others. So. On the one hand, he started this institute so he could say what he thought, and on the other hand, he hired me to, <laughs> and I quit guide him shutting up, saying, you know, saying, David, you really can't be political. You can't be, you know, you can't be partisan. What you have to do is like speak, talk policy, not politics, because the, ah, the policy is nice. the same across all. Yeah, right. The policy is is, is important, and, and and that's the, 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 the you know the things that we care about the most are the policy, not the politics. I'm so I'm so disheartened right. by. The difference, you know, the diff, there's a very, very important distinction between politics and governance, right? Good sure. governance is the responsibility. Sure. It's the administration of rights and responsibilities, right? But, but mm-hmm. politics is something else. That's the competition. It's the game for who gets the office. And politics is uh, is a very, very different thing than governance. And I'm, I'm, I'm a, I, it's very, I, responsible governance is, is, is one of the most important responsibilities that we, that we have. And, um, so I just didn't encourage David to speak on the governance side, not on the politics side. Gotcha. Very, very smart. And, and thank you for that little input on that, because I had no idea. I, I'm not familiar enough with Canada to know that in terms of the sure. whole not being allowed to go into politics. I think that's a bunch of crap. Sorry. I love your country, but, I mean, honestly, I do think that, that well, well that's, I'm not a politician that's, that's for lots of reasons. reasons. Yeah, I, I won't keep you all day on this one point, but it, in, it, in its it, it origin, it was a good idea. It was a, if you if you could have a political party that was a tax deductible charitable organization, then you have people who don't agree with the politics of that party supporting that party with their mm-hmm. tax dollars. That was the idea, so it sort of makes sense, right? But mm-hmm. but then you know if you have a if you if you have an un, um, uh, an honorable guy running the country, we had a fellow named Stephen Harper in the recent, not, not too long ago who was our prime minister, and he was using that law to target um, foundations that were his political enemies, and it was uh, uh-huh. it very unfo- it was very unfortunate that that law existed. But we found our way around it. We figured out how to deal with that properly, <laughs> and we did, and said what the hell we want anyways. But but in the origin, it makes sense because you don't want taxpayers to be supporting political views that they don't agree with, right? Sure. Oh, no, I agree with you as far as that goes, definitely. So, now, sure. um, obviously, there is a small elephant in the room, and I've had other people on the show before, and so this is kind of how I handle things because we've all had our circumstances in life. I myself have been arrested. I've admitted that before, clearly, and, I, mm-hmm. and I'm not really ashamed of it. I've obviously been quite open about it. It was nothing that was major, obviously. So I always allow, allow the guests that comes on 
if you wish to talk about your background, maybe anything that you've learned or anything that happened, or if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine. I figured I would just kind of throw it out there and see if you wanted to say anything because you know, I'm a pretty open format in, in terms of uh, I'm not here to judge you. Um, I guess they're not here to judge well, you either. Are, I just figured, well, people, if they research you, they already know, obviously. Well, people are uh, people are wondering what the hell she's talking about now, right? Is it is this guy another <laughs> Roy Moore? Is this guy? <laughs> I shouldn't I laugh. Was, it's uh, not funny. In about 2000, we started a business that was um, like uh, PayPal for online gaming for online gambling. Mm-hmm. And it was very, very mm-hmm. successful. We, um, uh, the, uh, it was called net teller. Uh, and, uh, net teller was a, a way to transfer money, uh, between North America and offshore online gaming sites. Uh, in back in the mm-hmm. day, it was mostly on uh, sports gambling. Nowadays, the biggest thing of course is poker. Uh, but right. we started that up and, uh, it was ex- extremely successful and we went public on the London stock exchange. And, you know, at one point we had, uh, uh, um, a market cap of around $2 billion, which is very, wow. very exciting. Um, and um, I, we pulled quite a bit of money off the table. And then eventually we were arrested. You know, I was arrested at my home on Malibu Road in Malibu. And um, the, uh, you know, the uh, the um, U.S. Marshals showed up at the FBI, three cars full to pick me up, and uh, off I went. So my life changed kind of overnight. Uh, at, um so um, at that point, uh, you know, uh, we wound up, uh, you know, in, uh, in before before his honor in, in uh, you know, the Lord of the Southern District of Manhattan. Uh, and uh, after about six years or seven years of being out on bail, um, I, uh, we, you know, we went through that uh, plea bargaining process. Um, I, th- right. I think everywhere else in the world, they call it extortion. Mm. <laughs> but anyway, it's not too, oh, too far to point on that. We wound up uh, I, I, between myself, my partner, and my company. We forfeited two hundred forty million dollars to uh, to the Department of Justice. So oh, we, we did pretty well, you know. I wound up. Wow. There, you know, I haven't had I haven't had a job since, but we had uh, we did we did very very well, and um, you know, I think I, gotcha. I think they they put a the, that whole process put a hiccup into online gaming, but only for about two weeks. And it's probably grown about by a factor of about ten since I was arrested. So it's just going wow. on and on. Actually, it's all—it's probably all going to be very legal down in the United States. You know what, Cindy? One of the one of the beautiful ironies of my life is the two things that have, you know, made me uh, the the happiest and the wealthiest in my life uh, were only only illegal in the whole history of human beings during my lifetime. So if it wasn't huh. for marijuana laws and gambling laws, I wouldn't be nearly as happy as I am. <laughs> oh my god! And now gosh. everything is legal. Now everything's oh legal. Oh my goodness! Okay, I can go down to I can go down to the store okay. downtown here in Ganges and uh, buy whatever I want with it's got you know THC in it, and uh, the, the cops just look at you and smile. It's beautiful. Oh my God! <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> Come on, Have you learned sometime. anything, or, or, or is there any uh, advice you would give to somebody out there, or whatever? Have you? Because I think it's always very important to. Um, well, we all learn from every experience, whether it's good, bad, or otherwise. Is there anything you kind of took away from that part that now that you're in a different place in your life? Well, I used to be a smart aleck when I was younger, and I'd say things like, "Well, I did learn when I was arrested for uh, for for selling LSD to cops uh, when I was uh, 17 years old in 1969." Uh, and uh, the, the the lesson I learned from that was to never sell dope to people I didn't know. <laughs> no, oh that was God, just a smart aleck for me. That was just, that was. Um, well, moving I right along. I, you know, yeah. yeah. As far as the U.S. gambling laws go, um, you know, it's 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 unwise to not steer clear of those guys because they they can really throw the book at you. They can really like stick a, put a stick in your spokes, and it's uh, it's pretty it's it's pretty uh, um, you know game changing when they do. So no matter how, how how right or wrong you feel, I think it's a really really good idea to um, you know to stand stand back and be quiet when. Um, you know, uh, Uncle Sam's Department of Justice wags a finger at you. It's time to shut up, for sure. Oh, yeah, definitely, I imagine. And the other thing we want to talk about before we get to the creative side of things is I know you're also co-founder of the the Smog blog, and I don't think anybody's ever heard of that, or at least, sadly, not enough people have. And I assume you're still involved with that, yes? Yes, I have. Just to yeah. clarify? Yeah, we're um... – okay. Got it. Yeah, we have there are, there are D smogs in four different jurisdictions now. The one in the U.S. in Seattle is called uh, 
Desmog blog, the one in Canada, it's called desmog.ca. We have desmog.australia and .uk as well now. Actually, there's one in Germany. There okay. are five now. The slug line for wow. Desmog is the, 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 the slug line is clearing up the PR pollution that clouds climate science. So my my partner in that, Jim That's Hogan, awful. is a is a very uh, yeah. It's a, well, it's a lot of work too because there's a lot of PR pollution <laughs> about climate. Oh my science. god, yeah. So, but oh it was, my god, uh, yeah. It was the the um, the scientists were very grateful to us, Cindy, because you know they had been spending half of their career arguing with um, climate change deniers. And of course, you can't talk to those guys. You're, you're never going to change their mind. They're not interested in climate science. What they're interested in is something else. They're interested in slowing down sure. regulatory incursions upon their revenue stream, right? So, so anyway, right. so what D. Smog said to these people was never ever talk to a climate change science, or a, climate, a climate change denier about the science because they don't care about the science. The only thing you talk to them about is where they got their money from. And as soon as you ask them that question, well, then they start talking to you about this foundation and that, and we don't know as private, and we have to keep our yes, yes rate, of course. <laughs> uh-huh. right? I understand. But you only, I when do. you're talking to a denier, the only thing you ever talk to him about is where he got his money and all, all the rest. Because the only thing they have to do, you see, is they don't have to prove any science at all. All they have to do is raise the level of doubt. And if they raise the level of doubt, then the, then, then the, our, our, our governors, our government, sorry, our government, um, uh, it has all the excuse they need to not take any of these major steps, you know, that they should be taking. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if, and, and so if they, if they raise the level of doubt, they're successful. They don't have to do any science at all. So what our job at the small blog was, was to try to help people understand that those people, they're, they're, they're all, all they're doing, their, their, their whole intention is just to raise doubt about climate science. And it's not, um, and it, there's, there's no science backing it up. It's just, uh, it's the same as, it's the same guys that did cigarettes, Cindy the same guys that did cigarettes um the uh you know we, we don't uh there's there's no science that connects uh tobacco with uh, lung disease remember that <laughs> oh my lord i do as she rolls her eyes you can see this from here i'm rolling yeah, they're, my they're, eyes they're really great uh, they're, they're they made really great careers out of uh, um lying for industry right and and fossil yeah. fuel is just the same you know, I'm like everybody else. I have cars that I put gasoline in, and I'm great. I'm, I'm grateful for the uh, the. I'm, I'm, I am grateful for the uh, development that happened in our world uh, on the on the backs of fossil fuel energy. But it's high time. It's way beyond high time that we figured out smarter energy because the costs of it are just horrifying. You know, I come from the, the province of Alberta in in Canada, where uh, in the north of there, there's a place where they, that you may have heard of the tar sands. They call them sometimes the oil sands, but it's a, a huge, huge very, very dirty way of, this, of, uh, of uh, you know, getting fossil fuels out of the ground. And the tailings ponds are vast. They're, you know, they're, 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 until they built that China, the Three Gorges Dam in China, uh, the tailings ponds for the Alberta tar sands uh, fossil fuel development uh, were the biggest reservoir built by man on the planet. And it's hugely huh. toxic. And, you know, the First Nations people downstreams have you know, lumps on their eyeballs and fish have two heads and all these things. And everybody denies that it's doing any damage, but the Albertans are just, you know, completely oblivious to the, uh, to the, uh, and it, oblivious in the name of easy money really is what it is. Alberta, I love okay. you, but you have to change your ways. Your children oh, yeah. will be paying. Yeah. Your grandchildren will be paying. <laughs> That's oh, yeah. not good My business, goodness. right? That's not responsible business. No. You know, to be passing off oh, the cost on our future generations, right? It's not. It's, that's not well, good business. Course. That's taking. And I've got children, business. obviously, or most of us have children that we have to worry about a future in terms of what's going to happen. What is our world going to be looking like in one year, two years, five years? That sort of good stuff. Um, as I might have mentioned earlier, you've done two wonderful things so as to implement um, positivity and change um, in our world. The first of which is your book, which is called All's Well, Where Thou Art, Earth, and Why. Um, there's a lot of complexity within the course of your book, meaning you cover an awful lot. Um, and a lot of it is also somewhat philosophical. A lot of it is um, factual. Somewhat of it is, is opinion. Um, you combine a whole lot of elements into one book. I know that you want to be a voice for change, obviously. So to those that are listening in that don't even know that this book exists, if there's one or two things that you want them to take away from this book, what is it specifically? What was your sole purpose, would you say, for creating this publication? 
Well, I, I, for, for the, 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 I, I'm going to say two things. First of all, we have to take a very honest look at where we where we stand uh, in in terms of our maturity, our knowledge, and uh, you know even our uniqueness in the universe. We have to stand back and take a, take a deep breath and really take a close look at that again. You know, a um, mm-hmm. hundred years ago, we hardly knew that our sun uh, was just another star. Um, and, uh, you know, now, now we know that there's, uh, you know, the multiverse hundred we're, we're, you know, if you look at it, uh, we're 150 generations out of the caves and, and, uh, now we, and we think we know our place in the universe that a hundred years ago, right. we didn't even know existed. We didn't even know it existed. And we think we know our place in it. You know, I, I just, the, the numbers game about our, u- our uniqueness meme, our uniqueness in the universe is sort of fun. You know, I think I calculate that, you know, if, if thoughtful animals came up on one in every 10 billion stars, right. so, you know, if thoughtful, thoughtful animals like us came up in one in every 10 billion stars, there would be 10 trillion intelligent species in the universe. You know, and our best excuse for uh, our, our best excuse for thinking we don't exist is that they haven't gotten in touch with us, as if anybody could right. get in touch with us, but for some reason would not bother. <laughs> Hello, you know, and, and you know, it's a the it's it's thing is the thing is you know we th- we think of ourselves as knowledgeable, you know, through history. Uh, you know, at right. any given point, if you if you did the cross section of the cumulative of human knowledge, you'd find a bunch of people who thought they had just about everything figured out, and you know, and mm-hmm. that was always always wrong. And it's very likely wrong today too. One of the ways I like to look at the knowledge part of it, Cindy, is that you know that what we've learned in the last ninety years during my mom's life um, is just astonishing. It's astonishing. You know, we went from um, not even knowing that our sun was a star to um, to knowing uh, what that light that we see 16 billion years away is from now. And if you take now, if you take that 90 years and project that into the future, what we've learned in the last 90 years, what we're going to learn in the next 90 years is just it's going to be we're going to learn 5000 times more stuff because our, our, our knowledge has become is coming much more quickly and it's much more reliable. So. Right. But what we're going to look at 5,000 times, Cindy, still, Mm -hmm. that's the smallest part of all of the things we don't know yet. Because what are we going to learn in the year, in the hundred years after that? And the hundred years after that. So that's the first thing. I want us to stand and take a really close look at where we are in eternity and infinity and, and be honest about it. You know, if we were honest, we would be humble. But I think we are neither. (laughs) The other thing (laughs) is. That's one thing. And the, the other thing, the other, the other thing of the two things is the thing that we are is the universe's vessels of consciousness. There is consciousness in the universe and we are the vessels of it. And the, the, the odds that we are alone are so vastly against us. We are not alone. There's probably trillions and trillions of intelligent species in the universe. And the odds that we are the most advanced of them are actually absolutely zero. So when we, you know, when, when we, you know, if, if, if you want to look at things the old way, like the universe, in, in, in that whole vast universe, we are the only intelligent beings, but then we are absolutely a miracle that is beyond, beyond calculation. And it's funny that we don't treat ourselves like that's what we are. You know, another one of these miracles beyond calculation dies every four, se- four seconds of hunger. And we have and we treat those miracles that with, with no respect whatsoever. So to me, the, the, the thing that I, I said, I hope I can inspire people to embrace from my book is to understand what, what, what it really means to be vessels of consciousness in the universe. We are, you know, if there are 10 trillion species in the universe that are conscious, like we are more or less, right? Right. And if there is nothing else in the universe than that, 10 trillion billions of consciousnesses, and if the you know, whole is greater than the sum of the parts, you know, if that's all there is in the universe, that's good enough for me. We need to honor what it is that we are. And what we are is one of, one, one of the most incredible miracles of the universe. We are the universe's vessels of consciousness. If you, don't, you, know, if you think about it long enough, I think we're going to understand that... Um, okay. You know, those trillions and trillions and trillions of consciousnesses are actually the consciousness of the universe. When you think about it, you know, um, you know, Carl Jung talked about the uh, the collective subconscious. Well, guess what? There's a collective conscious too. 
<laughs> we, we tend to experience our consciousness as being as individuals, but the reality is that consciousness is, is not individual. It's eternal and, and, and we share in it. And, um, uh, I'm, you know, I, 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 I can't prove to anybody what happens when this little vessel dies, but the consciousness does right. not die. I mean, I, I read, you know, that little bit of it in the book about, um, we are, we are not the well, we are the water. And the water is there before the well was built, and it's there a long after <laughs> the water is going to crumble. You know, and we hold, we have sure. our consciousness, but we think we think that it only exists as long as this this you know this little vessel that we call our body exists. And um, I, I I don't think we know enough to know that's for, that's you know absolutely uh, an insurmountable truth. I, I actually I feel quite strong that it's not. So here I am. <laughs> look where we are in the universe, and look honestly. And then appreciate what a miracle it is that we can just sit and listen to the birds, that we can sit and care. That what a miracle it is that we can care for everybody on our planet. What a miracle it is mm-hmm. that we have the capacity to actually husband this planet like, like good farmers and make it better, not worse. What are we doing here on this planet? Why do we feel the way we get? Why do we wake up in the morning and feel this kind of low grade ache? Well, it's because we don't understand what it is we're wasting our time on. You know, we should, we, we should actually be embracing trees, you guys. <laughs> Embrace <laughs> let's trees. be a tree hugger. I like that tree hugger. Exactly. Thing. And we can, you know, and the wind will blow through our leaves and through our hair because we are all the same <laughs> thing. We're life in the universe. Right? We are, we are life in the universe and we are that very special, very, very special kind of life that not only lives and reproduces and continues, but we dream dreams and we know how to make those dreams come real. And that is a miracle. You know, a deer might be able to dream a dream, but a deer doesn't have a clue about how to make, how to make it real. <laughs> right. But we do. No, we do. I know. I we can be deaf. We can be deaf and write a ninth symphony. Well, and, and here's what I find so interesting, and, and I'm going to ask you in a second in terms of what, sure. what sort of feedback you, you've been receiving. But I, obviously, of course, some of the some of the biggest topics that come away from this book, you know, we're, we're talking science and spirituality, consciousness, but the, just the overall idea of faith and hope and love, which is the, which are the, the, in my opinion, the three most important qualities that one should have or maintain having. So when people have read your book, have you been getting feedback from them? I mean, obviously there's online reviews, things like that. But do people come to you or approach you and give you honest feedback on what they think of the end result of your book? I'm just curious. Well, they 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 do, and when you know the pe- people who the people who take time to absorb it um, are 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 knocked out by it. But it's it's a bit um, it's a bit rangy, Cindy. You know, it goes all over the place, like you say, and it's a bit it's a lot to pull together right. in a short book. It's a lot to pull right. together, and, I, and I'm pretty sure some people, you know, read parts of it and think, wow, that's very interesting, but then when it gets sort of serious in the middle, it's maybe less interesting, it's, you know, sure. and then you get to the end of I the book, it. and it's all about, you know, peace and love and stuff like that, so sometimes people don't even get to the end of the book, but I think I have to give it time, and let, let me put it this way, the people, the, the, pe- pe- people who I deeply respect have given me, you know, a completely two thumbs up on the book. The po- popular, the the, 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 pop, the popular market has has not quite uh, um, embraced it yet. But um, you know, it's uh, it, it, it will be this book will be here for a long time, and um, I'm uh, I'm very very grateful for the responses that I do get from uh, people that I honor. Yeah, That's let me put it that cool. way. I like that. And then, of course, he decides in his mid fifties. Well, what the hell? Let's start uh, recording an album in mid fifties, which I think is majorly cool. And I and I want you to speak about that because oftentimes I think society has kind of lumped um, its creatives into a corner and said, "Well, socially, you really should start recording at twenty, thirty, forty. You should be playing, recording, singing, da 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 da." But yet, you chose to hold off and pick this time of your life to do that. So. If you would please speak to your audience a bit about um, what what is it like recording music older and being a little bit later on in life? Has it helped you more in terms of learning and, and critiquing your process, your work, your art? Um, and to those that are out there wondering, should I be embarking on this at this point in my life? What would you say to them? Absolutely, 
Absolutely. I think the, um, you know, I, I, I was fortunate that, you know, money came to me when I was older uh, because I had, I had been a poor guy, you know, I had been a working guy and, um, and, and I, and, and, you know, uh, I've been around long enough to know what's what. And uh, the same thing goes for music. You know, um, I was very, very fortunate to, to come to money because I was able to take a whole bunch of it down to the recording studio in Los Angeles. Uh, and I, and um, I was able to afford, you know, nothing but absolutely the best in musicians, you know, the, the uh, you know, Bill Payne from Little Feet and uh, Hutch Hutchison's the mm. bass player, for Bonnie Raitt and Dean Parks has played guitar on every record that's ever been made. You know, or Barbara Streisand, he's the guy from Steely Dan, of course, but Dean Parr and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, um, there was all, all, all these really wonderful, the guy who produced the record for him, he's named Brian Ahern. He was, uh, he's produced, uh, he's married, he was married to Emmy Lou Harris and produced 15 of her records. So, the, they, you know, these guys really, really knew what they were doing. And one of the things that those guys know, those studio musicians, Jim Keltner, the rest of them, they, they've, they've had to endure every prima donna that ever existed in the music industry, <laughs> you know, and sometimes they played for them and sometimes they did not, but I was lucky sure. enough to go into the studio with those guys and know there's nothing I can tell those guys about how to play music. And all we have to do is mm-hmm. just let them, let them hear the song and let them decide what they want to play with. And, you know, I think you've maybe heard some of the results of it, but so I would say that the, the more, um, the, the, the less uh, uh, tied up we are to our own uh, thing and the more uh, collaborative we're prepared to be, you know, the better the music is going to be. So, yeah, start playing piano when you're 50, and by the time you're 60, you'll wind up in the studio with some people that know better than you, and you'll listen to what they've got to say, and, and, and they'll appreciate that you listen, and you'll appreciate the results. So there is there is no age that's t- there's no age that's too old to play. It's like music is like doubles tennis. You can play it when you're 90. Oh, oh my God. So that. Just like you can have, have babies you when you're 90 about, until they hear. Have you seen, yeah. Have you seen, have you, have you seen those things, uh, Cindy, about um, uh, people who have uh, dementia, people, Alzheimer's and, and other uh, um, horrifying conditions like that? But mm-hmm. they, they played music when they were younger, and they, still, they can still sit down at the piano and play the old songs, right? They can't remember anything, mm-hmm. but they can play the song. Sure. Right. Or they That's can, really they can play you know, yeah, music, uh, music works on a different, um, uh, I think it works, it works on a different, I'm going to, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a scientist about this. I'm, I'm just speaking completely an amateur hack, sure. but it works with a different part of our brain and our spirit than, um, you know, accounting does. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, and the thing is, I guess I want to ask you this question because I've had the benefit of listening to a great deal of your music because, of course, I've been to your site and some people may not necessarily have been on there. So if you would, please tell them a bit about your initial um, record that you've recorded, of course, because they haven't heard the music. And then I picked out a song that I liked, actually, um, out of all the ones I listened to. I know that you said you could recommend one, but then I just listened and I was like, I heard it and I'm like, I just like this song. Which I can hardly wait to hear which one you chose. <laughs> so, if you would please Thanks. tell them tell them a bit about your record in terms of um, what they can expect when they listen to the various tunes, etc. Um, and then I'll go ahead and play one of your songs. Well, it is basically all over the map, from kind of romantic uh, ballads to um, to uh, rip your face off rock and roll, uh, and and a lot of different little side trips in between. Um, but, um, when, when I went into the studio, like I said, I was, I, I had, I had what, you know, I, I, started, I I'm going to say, in, you know, without, you know, uh, I, I would say my, my songs are, you know, decent songs. Some of them are excellent. Some of them are just, you know, okay. But they're, um, but in, in these guys' hands, I, I began to let them go where, where they wanted to take them. But, um, you know, I'm a classic rock fan. I'm that, you know, I'm that vintage. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I grew up admiring guys like, you know, Neil Young, of course, and I'm Joni Mitchell. The, there's a couple of Canadians for you right now. Uh, but, um, and so people think that there's some kind of, uh, you know, that you can see those roots in it. Uh, but um, I was a choir boy when I was a kid, too, and I had class, trained in classical piano up to a certain level. So I, I, I tried to bring um, uh, a, a, a bit more... Uh, a, a, wide, a wider range of music to the table, but the, you know, I think, you know, what kind of music is my music? Well, you know, what kind of music is the Beatles white album, right? It's all over right. the map. Right. right. 
Whatever, exactly. whatever it's the, you know, you know, and that's sort of how I, you know, I, I don't, I don't claim that my stuff is as good as theirs, but it's as rangy as theirs is. <laughs> sure. So there, what did you pick? Which one did you, which, which one did you fall for, Cindy? Well, um, I, I have two songs, and one we won't have time to play for, but there's a surprise element with that one. But the one that I picked was Juice. I like Juice. <laughs> oh yeah, that's... I do. I like Juice. <laughs> I yeah, can't help it. Like I said, it's part right? of my personality. <laughs> it's just cool. It, it 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 just it was interesting. It had a good beat. Not that the others don't, folks, because I'm not trying to take away from some of the other material on your website. Some of it is really well done. In fact, a lot of it is really well done. Some of it I listened to it and I'm like, oh, okay, this is good. And then some of it I was like, yeah, I'm really digging this. You know what I'm saying? So everybody has their cool. own different taste. So I'm just gonna shut up for the next three minutes and we're gonna play his song. It's called Juice. Thanks. I don't know if I should drink. My doctor says I gotta think. Agrees it's not too bad for hurts, but not so much for other parts. I got so scared, I asked my shrink. She said quit, red, white, and pink. I listened, Lord, but how I tried. But if I said I quit, I lied. I quit whiskey, Kansas City. I laid off. reason it's just kind of skippy and upbeat and i was like yeah this is a really cool song i like it and and i like i like the sound of your voice i like the sound of the instrumentation i just thought it was really cool and well put together you know and and you'll hear that folks if you go well of course when you go on the website you're going to hear a lot of those different things in terms of different sounds and and the the pitch and the tone of your voice i think changes in a couple of them which is kind of nice so i get to see a little bit of diversity there um obviously i can't speak for everybody because i'm sure not all sixty thousand people that are listening or will listen have actually gone to see you so hopefully they will go and listen to that or purchase the book i should say um now my other question to you is a lot of times mm-hmm. people come on the show one of the things they're looking for is okay so this guy's written a book and he does music etc so are you out and about playing to where people could actually go and watch you play, like live acoustical gigs, things like that? Is it something on the horizon? I've got um, – uh, I, I, I do a little bit of that in Canada, but there's, uh, I'm not permitted to come to the States. But uh, right. I have a lawyer on retainer in Seattle who's uh, going to uh, reestablish my privilege of coming back to your country, which I love so much. Nice. 
and uh, and I hope uh, hope to be able to come down there uh, within a year or so. And um, I'm pretty sure the guys that played on that record will come out with me if I ask them to. So the answer is oh, short to medium term, no long term. I hope so. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That would be great, just because obviously if they hear you and they like the music, of course, a lot of times we want to go and see somebody play in person. That kind of goes without saying, certainly. God, I can't believe this. Well, now tell me, you know, this has been almost an hour already. Can you believe that? This time just goes so amazingly quickly on this show. I don't know what it is. I get into a good conversation, and the time's all gone. I'm like, I always feel like I need to have two hours with everybody all the time just to cover everything. But unfortunately, I I'm very grateful to you. Well, I'm very grateful um, to you for sharing one hour. Well, that's okay, because um, the very last thing that I'm going to do, in case you have never heard my radio show before, which you may not have, is there's always a surprise element on the show. I always surprise my guests with something. And why? It's just because it's fun to do. And then I get to tell you what I think of you briefly. I always tell everyone what I think of them because it's not scripted. That means I haven't actually sat down and written it in the journalistic fashion. I just, uh, off the top of my head or the inside of my heart, come up with some reflections of what I think of the guest. So um, I want to let you know, first off, that once this interview is finished, because obviously Patty comes on after you, in a couple of hours the episode gets archived, and what happens is there will be a Blog Talk Radio link, and there will also be a YouTube link for both for you for your interview. I'll send that off to you, so this way any fans or followers or people that want to hear your interview will be able to access it. And it's their archive for all of time, so anybody can go back and listen. So there's that portion of it, as far as that goes. I'm going to read off a bunch of places to find you, and when I get done, just let me know if I've forgotten anything. But before I do that, tell me how to pronounce your last name, because I don't want to screw it up. <laughs> Lefebvre. It's Lefebvre. Yep. That was simple enough. Okay, I was afraid to get that screwed up. Okay, good. Now I got it right. All right, so here we go. The website is johnlefebvre.com, and let me tell you how that's spelled. It's L-E-F-E-B-V-R-E.com. He has a Facebook page, Let's Little Fave Music. He has a Wikipedia profile. He is on Amazon, Smashwords, Reverb Nation, YouTube, Spotify. On Twitter, it's spelled, and it's at, and that's P S A L N G. S. And, of course, the DSmog blog we were referring to before, it's dsmogblog.com. Any other place where folks can find you? Those will do. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't missing anything. Enough's because enough. oftentimes people listen and it's like, yeah, if they can't find you off of one of those, there's a problem. Now, as far as the surprise goes, one of the things that you may not know, but if you were listening when I first started the app in a way before I put you on air, is one of my announcements is at starting next month, and I'm very excited about this, I've written four films. This is the very first time that I'm actually going to film my own film, and I'm very excited about this. It's going to be a black and white film. It's right along your line, actually. It's it's the numerous ways that uh, humans show each other that they love each other, meaning the words I love you. And, and some of it's very dark, I won't lie. I mean, you know, sometimes I love you means someone slapping you or somebody – abandoning you, etc. And then there's the whole other flip side of the fence. It's about rainbows and love and all these various ways that, that humans can express love positively. And so I happen to be looking for music and I came across this beautiful song and sadly it does not have your voice in it, but it's a beautiful instrumental piece. So I thought if I begged you, you would allow me to use it within the course of my film. Emily, there are no words. I'd be How delighted. did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the only one with no words. <laughs> I know. Darn it. See, I thought you'd be all Emily. like, which one does she want to use? But that, yes, I, I listened to it, and then I listened to it again, and I'm like, and it's not just because it's instrumental. I like the sound of it, and it fits very well within the course of um, one of the more positive points of the film because I know that it wouldn't do any justice to put it in the dark side of things because it doesn't fit. I'm honored. It just really it's a great honor. Fit. Emily sure? is my daughter. You don't mind? And, uh, Absolutely not at all. Oh. Emily is my daughter, and the guitar player is Dean Parks. It's beautiful, isn't it? Oh, that's awesome. it, it not only is it beautiful, but it just spoke something to me. And I thought to myself, this is not something that I don't want to have in here, obviously. Clearly, um, we're going to be shooting it next month. And what's really cool is I only have about a week to shoot it. And what I think is so neat about it is I wrote it in preparation for the 100 Words Festival. So what that means is um, – I only have 100 words in it. So a lot of it requires the music and the acting to do all the work for me. And I think it's beautifully well done. It's a very personal piece to me. So it's very important to me to write people in it. And if all goes well, we're going to submit it to Cannes first. So I'm super excited and super terrified all at once. 
So if it gets accepted, very, very oh, my God, how cool is that? that? Oh, my God, right? Yeah. Well, now this means we're kind of stuck with each other, so to speak. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm, 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 but, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, oh, that's awesome. And then the last thing I want to say to you, because I know that Patty is now officially waiting for her interview to start, so I don't want to leave her holding too terribly much, is Thank these you. are my impressions of you, my new friend, John. I think it's very refreshing and very revitalizing to see someone who is of an older generation, and I mean that in the most loving way, to come across not only in both words as well as in his tunes in terms of actual composition of music, coming across with messages of such love and light and hope and faith and the ability to still have humanity, humility, and most importantly have hope in the human race that we all will eventually unite in one purpose and one goal. I think that's very refreshing. I think we live in a society right now where things are very dark and dismal. I love the fact that there are people like yourself, myself, that are trying to resurrect some belief that people are by and large good, that they care about their climate, that they care about one another, and that they are open and honest about who they are, what they want. And obviously, of course, you've had somewhat of what we call a checkered background, but what's really super cool about you is that you stayed very true to yourself. I was a little nervous about interviewing you because I wasn't sure what to expect, but you're an absolutely lovely human being. I could not be more thrilled that you're going to let me use your music. I'm so excited about this. And and I'll fill you in on a lot of this after the show, but I just wanted to let you know that it's really, truly been a privilege. And Antonio Hall, I don't want to forget to mention her. I cannot thank you enough for aligning the both of us. Without her, we would not have this show right now. So I'm just elated that you came on. I hope that I've done a good job for you and please know you can come back anytime you want i'm, I'm not going anywhere very, at least i don't think i'm going anywhere <laughs> very very gratified to be here thanks so much cindy very nice oh, to thank meet you. you oh wonderful you too and i'll be in touch like i said if not after the show in the near future and then we'll talk about how to collaborate and put all this stuff together i look forward to chatting with you though and thanks for coming again delighted, delighted. thank you very much all right, okay. dear. enjoy your Bye-bye. day bye-bye sure all right, kids, before I get Patty on the line, real quickly, I want to remind everybody one more time, a big thanks, AntonioHall.com. I cannot thank you enough for aligning the two of us together. And like I mentioned, if you go to his website, JohnLefave.com, go ahead and check out the song, Emily, There Are No Words. That's the one that we're talking about in terms of putting into my film. And then obviously Juice is also on there. You're going to see just a number of different tracks. So I'm super, super excited to be able to highlight him. So without further ado, oh, my God, I'm so mega nervous because Patty on site is coming on the show in like three seconds. Are we ready? I think so. Let's do it. Viewer. Is this Patty Hughes? Yeah, Patty. Yeah, I'm sorry. I start talking right away. Hi, Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> She's here. Hi, audience. She's in the oh. studio. I'm so, so petrified. Fun. I thought I was afraid I of my know, last guest. Now you're on the show. Holy shit. I'm afraid of I you. I what you're, you're saying like with the last... Mega talent. See, look how excited we are. We're just talking, talking, talking. I loved <laughs> what you said with the last guest. Like people are true. inherently good. That's so. That was so they sweet. Are. I but agree. But it's true though. I mean, seriously, people are Agreed. inherently good. I think you just need to remind them because right now we're in a shit show, so to speak, in terms of our society and how things are, and and it's not pretty right now. So anytime, well, you know, you're on my page all the time. I'm always doing this. Right. You're reading this now thing. I do that on purpose because people need to hear and be reminded that not everything is as awful as it seems it is. Obviously, one of the reasons you're on my show right now is to talk about one of your concepts. Oh, my God, I'm so excited. And there's so much to talk about. I can't even stand it right now. I'm so excited and nervous. It's like, you're such a big deal, man. I was like, first time I met Patty in, in New York, I was like, okay, now she's she's smart. She's pretty. She has her shit together, and I'm at a table with her the first time. And then she sends me her bio, and I'm like, oh, holy hell, what have I gotten into? I'm petrified <laughs> of her now. Like, she's you, um, a mega talent. I'm like, no one. I'm, like, in the corner here on my little tiny couch. Like, I'm nothing now. Oh, Patty, no. Okay. <laughs> Come on. You were, so. like, a bright <laughs> sunshine in the middle of the day. You just were. And oh I love God. your honesty, and you go right in. I know. Like, that's fine I already, do. and this is what you should do. It was, it was great. <laughs> it was good. You're so, you know, it it is, you're so real. So that's, I appreciate that. I do. I try very, very hard, as a matter of fact, I do. So I have a lot of different questions, so we'll, uh, of course, like typical okay. Cindy, we'll get right into it. The first thing that people don't know is your hashtag all the time is Patty on Site. So for the first time, yes. if, if somebody's looking at the name Patty Hughes, they don't really get what the Patty on Site is. So let's start with that. Let's do a background on where did the Patty sure. on Site come from? Because I used to work at um, Girl Magazine, which was associated with Mode Magazine. It was the first curvy 
um, really bona fide magazine out there. And it was great because I okay. dealt with um, women of sizes like 12 and 16 and 10, just curvy girls. And they, I was um, actually with the girl portion of it, which was for the younger audience, which I loved, loved, loved. And I was the editor at large. So when I would come, I was working Fashion Week at the same time and working on these other jobs. So when I would come to the office, I would come in and I would say right away, I'm like, I'm here, um, but i got to leave because I'm going to be on site. So I would say that every single time. I'm like, oh, I can't come in today because I'm on site. Because, I, like I said, I'd be at Fashion Week or on another <laughs> event. So one of the girls is an editor in the office. She used to go, oh, Oh, it's Patty on site. So it was really funny, and it just and I kept it always because I loved it. And when I see her, Victoria, when I see her here and there, I'm like, I'm still calling myself Patty on site, and she just busts out laughing. So that's how it was. So then every time I'd come there to the office, they wouldn't even say Patty Hughes is here. They go Patty's on site. So that's <laughs> what I adapted that, <laughs> which is great. So, because then that went on to when I worked Fashion Week, I would call in when I arrived on site. I go, Patty's on site. So it just evolved and it kept going and going. So I love my little hashtag. It's very fun. I love that. Oh, that's so cute. That means when yeah. she gets married, it'll be Mr. and Mrs. Patty on site then. So then all the right. husbands yes, will be on site with her and they'll be the Mr. and Mrs. Patty on site. How good is that, right? Okay, there you so go. let's delve right into I that, that. Because some of... <laughs> Some of my friends have looked at you, and, of course, everybody always wants to hit on my guests. Notice how they never want to hit on me, but they always want to hit on my guests. How ironic is that? So we have to talk about your love life because people are looking at you and saying that you're attractive. So let's talk about that, Patty. Are we singling, mingling? What's happening in our love world? Because we all know I don't have one. (laughs) Well, my dream guy would be Australian because an accent is beyond and I would love, this is so funny, all of a sudden this is a dating site. Okay, he'd have to be at least 6'2". Um, 40s is good, 30s is good. Um, having kids is great, love to be a stepmom. Um, but, yeah, he's got to have that mm-hmm. accent. All about the accent. Really? It's funny, too, because I, and I, do, and I, I really gravitate toward men with accents. And, but I wrote that once on my page, and then someone goes, well, what accent? It's got to be a certain one. And I was like, <laughs> it made me laugh because it's like, I usually embrace all accents, but it makes you think. It's like, what's that going to sound like? What's that going to sound like? So that's really kind of funny to me. But, yeah, I think um, I'm hoping to take my brand to Australia. I mean, that is so on the list that it's not even funny. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, and New Zealand. I'm looking at New Zealand, too, because what I found through a lot of my research is that um, the curvy girls are a little bit underrepresented uh, mm-hmm. word in Australia and New Zealand, and they welcome Americans. They like they embrace that, and that's really something that I want to cultivate and take my brand on the road there. Because I think, yeah, I think that would be awesome. So then it's unbound. Then I mean, it's obvious. I might as well go where they are. So there'll be plenty of Aussie well, right. men there. Yeah. So I'm not worried. <laughs> So now here's a dumb question because I know Patty Hughes and those of you that are listening in that mail are just learning about her now. So here's my question. She has about 8,000 things on her resume like I do. So here I'm thinking, what are you going to do, like 10 minutes speed dating? Because the reality is, does Patty Hughes have time for that, Mr. Special stuff? What if Mr. Big shows up tomorrow? Are you going to be like, I don't have any time right now because I'm working on Curvy Girls, so I can't do this right now. Oh, no, 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 no. I can, I, can, I can budget a schedule. It's not a problem. <laughs> that is not <laughs> like a problem. I can fit you in. Yeah. What about, that, yeah, what about that, a New Yorker? Yeah, what yeah, about you a New have Yorker? To, they have accents, right? Like they, they talk well, like but, that uh, a little bit. Well, uh, um, okay. <laughs> I'm never going to say accent, never. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'm such I I'm such a maven for like old movies and old Hollywood, which I love, and Doris Day and all that. So wow. I'm just kind of still holding out for my matinee idol. Yeah, I kind of am. Oh, listen to yeah. this. Are you hearing that? So she's single and ready to mingle. And what are you like, 25 now? Don't even tell your age. Don't do that because we don't do. Oh no, I I used to, I'm older, I, I used to say I'm younger than Madonna, and I'm older than Brandy. <laughs> So whatever is in there, I'm good. (laughs) Okay. Now, we have to seriously talk about this part because we are both very huge buffs of uh, silent film and black and whites and and some of the old movie stars. So let's talk about this a little bit because we're both kind of in that that same realm of PR there. 
So Mm -hmm. uh, unless you live under a rock, sadly, we all know that Hollywood is kind of sort of crumbling around us little by little by little in terms of that. And you and I, of course, are are connoisseurs of some of the older, you know, classic television and classic film sort of things. Do you think that some semblance of some of the classic old style Hollywood still exists out there? Because I'm getting nervous. Frankly, I'm a little concerned about it. I do. I do. I'm a believer that I, I think there's a lot of people with values um, and I just think now, like, all of this sludge and mush is coming up to the top, right. which is good, because once you filter that out, then all the good stuff can come out. So I'm glad, yeah. I have to say, I'm really glad, in a sense, it's happening. The women are so brave. I I can't, I applaud them so much. I'm like, good for you, because it's disgusting right. what those men did and take advantage. But I, I'm a still believer right. in true classic Hollywood. We've got George Clooney. Like, there's men out there and women that are good and forthright. So it's good to just get all this crap out of there. It's, it's, it's yeah, I still believe in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, and new faces. Let's yeah, and infiltrate some new people and some new energy. I think is important too. Definitely. Which I put, well, one of the things <laughs> one of the things that we're trying to, and, and sadly, it's not just women. I mean, I truly believe that there are men out there that are kind of getting accosted as well, and they're kind of stuck in that cycle too, in terms of harassment, abuse, things like that. Agreed. You know, and one of the things that you're so positive in doing that I love is empowerment of women and women of all mm-hmm. sizes, all shapes, all colors, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So talk to me a little bit about the stigma that's out there, because I know we're coming a long way in terms of things, but I know that there's still that stereotypical society sort of pushed mentality of, well, the beautiful people are this size, this weight, this plus size, this look, this ethnicity. Why do you think that that's still so prevalent within our industry? Why is there that need to kind of mandate what the ideal should or could or or what we expect it to look like? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, right, yeah. I, I, I sincerely think it's changing, um, especially since I started in the fashion industry. I think sometimes it's been, it, it spins from people are nervous about change, nervous about embracing something that doesn't look like them. Um, right. But you know that's what I and, and a little jealous perhaps um, I have to say, but um, on the same note I think it's changing so much every day. Thank you, Ashley Graham. Um, if anything, she is such the poster child for gorgeous, curvy, fit, healthy. Like that's just so important. I think she's a great role model for that. Um, but I, I, I think it's changing. You know, it's funny. I was watching television, too, and I love – I was watching like Hulu. I love Mindy, who's got her show on Hulu. I go, when did we ever see a brown girl, curvy, in the lead and has all these great, beautiful boyfriends? Like, I freaking mm-hmm. love all that. Right. Yeah, and, that, and I had never seen that. And I was watching the other show, um, Kevin Can Wait, uh, with Kevin yep. from uh, Camp Queens, and his daughter's a little curvy. And I go, how cute is that? So I think right. a lot is changing. And it doesn't – and I – I like the fact that it's not it hasn't been a big fuss of. She's just a girl. Like, you know what right. I mean? And Mindy's just a girl. It's funny because when I watch, um, back to like Hollywood, but when I watch uh, British films and British television, also Australian films and television, when the girl is curvier or of color for that matter, it's not a big issue. Right. And I was like, America, come on, because this is kind of what we look like now. So um, right. I think it's changing. When I worked, um, I've worked – over 30 seasons in Fashion Week, directly with a production mm-hmm. company that produced all of Fashion Week. And we used to show four times a year. That's why it came up to 30 seasons. But I used to say all the time, all the time, why don't these designers just put a curvier model on the runway with the straight size models? What's the big deal? Mm-hmm. Like, look like the audience. And now, right. finally, after season seasons, they're doing that last season, 27, 27 shows had curvy girls in their shows. Anna Sui, you know, Jeremy Scott, like all the big ones did that. It, uh, Michael Kors, I go, it's so smart. It's smart business. For anything else, right. it is smart marketing. And I was like, this is so awesome. It's, and just do it. And I love fanfare. Just do it. So I was really proud. And so it's really funny because people that know me and me working Fashion Week all of those years will come up to me. They go, Patty, did you see there was a curvy girl on the show? I go, I saw it. So that was just something that I had wanted so much, that and diversity, so much for 
such a long time, and now now it's happening. It's hot. And it's, right. to me, too, if you don't have models of color in your show, if you don't have a curvier model, you're just not hip. <laughs> At the end of the day, Ooh, listen to not, her. you know, you're just not with it. Heavier is hip. That's what I'm saying. Heavier yeah, is hip. Yeah. Hashtag yeah. heavier <laughs> is hip. Excuse me. Yes. Just saying. Definitely. Throwing that out there. Definitely. Now, since, and, and, since you just. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Listen up, you're right I on we are. Because you, really funny. you hopped on the seasons of New York City Fashion Week. Two questions relative to Fashion Week. Number one, why is there a Fashion Week every two weeks in New York City? Number two, because you're best to ask this question to, and I'm not trying to be judgmental, but I've seen some of the styles. Um, I don't know how impressed I am. I'm not going to lie about that one. Sometimes I look at some of what they call the newer fashion in New York. I'm a little scared. I'm not going to lie. You know why? Because I'm not the hippest chick in the world, but I don't even know if I will wear some of that stuff. But you're the expert here, so you tell me. But more importantly, why is there Fashion Week 27 times a week, or 27 times a year, I should say, in New York City? <laughs> it's Fashion okay, Week every oh, other week, right? No, it's only four times a season. I'm sorry. Whatever. Twice, twice a season. Winter, it'll be one. It'll be one in September, and then one again in January, and then one again in September. Got it. And then they they okay. sometimes they'll have bridal in between, okay, and then they'll have resorts oh, right. in between. Yeah, okay. it's um, it, it, when the fashion week first started, it was really just for the buyers and for the press, but now it's evolved into something else. Uh, I knew a lot of us missed the old days when in the tents, where when I worked with Fred Mouse, which which was awesome. It was in the tents in one area, which was great. Uh, now mm-hmm. it's kind of all over the city. Uh, it's a little frustrating because you have to go up, down, downtown, blah, blah, blah. But right. it has opened it up to a lot of newer designers, which is great. Um, anyone can show now. Well, we'll see what happens. I, I, we'll see if it changes up a little bit. But as far as the styles are concerned, you have to remember things that you see on the runway is not necessarily exactly what you're going to see in the stores. That's for show right. and for theater. And then they water it down. Um, they change it when it goes to the retail level. So I think it's for everyone when you look at it, you, you should pick and choose what you like. I would advise you just look at as many shows as you can, you can look them online, which is great. And then you pick and choose what right. you like from there. There could be elements that you might be like, oh, I didn't know. I would try that. That might be cute. Um, I think you have to look at it that way. Look at it with an editor's eye in that sense. That, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I think you have to – don't embrace everything, but I'm sure you could find some pieces that make sense for you. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind I of gotcha. what I think. Yeah. Cool. Well, and piggybacking on that, because, again, obviously, I know that you are in tune with a lot of what um, I'm in tune with in terms of – now, they've always had that long-standing like, fashion police, et cetera. So, of course, obviously, award shows and everything else get critiqued as far as that goes. So I'm curious if you watch those and you say to yourself, because maybe it's just me and I'm just a lay person who picks up my own clothing, but my sense of things is I don't know that I would necessarily tune into e-television and whatever they dictate as being the best or worst dressed is the best or worst dressed out there. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I think it's all a matter of what's catered to making you feel beautiful on the inside and the outside. I think clothing can only do so much, but some of that's inside. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, for instance, if Patty gets up in the morning, and says, I want to make a fashion statement, how does she decide what's fashionable for her? Because that's what I think is important. You tell me. Yeah, you know what? If I like it and, I feel, and it fits and I feel good, it's fashionable for me. That's it. That's, that's all her father is. <laughs> Listen to that fashion advice. She's an expert. That's, there you go right there. Does it fit? Yeah, and that should be for everyone. I, I, think, um, I, I don't think people should live with limitations especially if it makes you feel right. good, and it fits. A fit is key. Fit is very much key. Um, it's got to fit you. I think, and I think everybody would right. feel comfortable if it fits. Um, I, I don't really subscribe to those people saying the worst and the best because that's a matter of taste. Right. And sure. I think it's a little bit – it's not kind. And let's face it, the best who ever did red carpet was Joan Rivers. Don, that she was the absolute oh, best because she, it was entertaining and funny. Yeah, right. so – yeah, she was. I, I don't think anyone's mastered it since her, so I really don't. I agree. Pay much attention to that. And, and the other thing, like when the Met Ball happens here, which happens once a year, the big Met Gala, that is, um, right. yeah, that which is amazing, with Anna Winter, like that is just beyond. Um, afterward, so many people are like, I don't like like Rihanna. Well, I don't like this, but so many of the people I didn't like were on theme. Because each season there's a theme, and you have to look at it that oh, yeah. way. And I think people forget that, and they're like, that looked terrible. I'm like, no, it was on theme. 
Yeah. Like Caroline Kennedy, right. she was so on theme, and people were like, we don't like this and that. I'm like, right. she was on theme for the night. And as far as I'm sure. concerned, she hit it. So I just think right. we have to be careful sometimes criticizing the way other people look, even though they're stars. It's just True. not. It's just not kind. And, you know, I don't know. Worry about yourself and your own closet. I agree. I do. I think. I so. totally yeah. agree with that, actually. <laughs> now, one of the coolest yeah. things about Patty, besides the 57 other things we're going to highlight, is she has appeared in sex. She appeared in Sex in the City. Now, I've been called the Carrie Bradshaw of Wisconsin, which I thought was so cool, but I'm like, oh, my God, she was in the real life Sex in the City. <laughs> so um, I know you're going to tell me that you met Mr. Big and he's single and he's waiting for me. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I, I didn't think mean so. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my God, I hate you. Um, but no, seriously, <laughs> most of us who watch, uh, <laughs> well, I'm just keeping it real. Most You're of us funny. who have watched the movie, obviously, we watch this and we're like, oh my God, how cool must that be to do something like that? So in reality, tell us a bit about how you got involved, obviously, with the movie itself, and what is it like to be on a set? Because I think sometimes people think it's glamorous, which it is to some extent, but there's realities to being on set, right? Yes, it's long hours. Um, I had heels on that day, too, so I was standing in my heels, which I don't usually stand in heels, for virtually hours. Um, to oh me, God. it's still exciting, but it's it's a long process. I happen to have known the assistant director on the movie, and she was like, do you want to be in the movie? And I was like, yeah. So I played a fashion editor, and I had my big hair, and then I had um, my leopard coat, and I had scenes with the girls, and at one point they had us all, and I'm in the first first movie and it's when they're going to the fashion show and you can see me walking up the stairs right. and ahead of them so I had a scene with them so they had placed all of them together and then I was right next to them and I had my big hair my heels this leopard coat <laughs> so we started talking like this like just not talking I didn't really have lines but you know to chat for the scene all of a sudden they stop right. someone comes over and just moves me right out of the scene I was like mortified, and then I realized I go, oh my god, I probably look like RuPaul next to these girls because I look so tall and all big hair, big coat, and I think I just over oh <laughs> I overpowered them, and it was really funny. And at first, when I got oh to on set, I was like, oh, I'm gonna be, I'm right here, and I stood in to Cynthia Nixon's spot, and her ex, I'm just standing there. Oh she god. goes, that's my spot, <laughs> and we both like bust out laughing, like she had such a great sense of humor so and all the other girls were laughing too sure. it's funny but I was like oh my gosh and then we had at that point I was just ready to cry and go home and then one of the one of the directors I think or PA had come up to me he goes don't worry don't worry just come down it's gonna be fine I go I want to go home he's like no just don't worry about it real sweet so then our next scene was during the mock type fashion show so they placed I went in they let everyone into the Written into the arena that looked like a fashion show. And so I had already worked so many fashion weeks, so I already knew what it was supposed to look like. There was a couple of things I was like, you should change this and that. And they're, they were changing it, which was kind of funny. But just like things are on the seats, I was like, they would never do that. They wouldn't put a credential on the seat. They, you know, they just put the program on the seat. I was telling the director, not the director, but the art director what to do. And she was like, okay, right. I'll fix it. It was kind of funny. It was cute. But anyway, so we walk in, and I'm like, I'm going to sit right in the front row. So I sat in the front row. And next to another celeb, and I go, I'm going to be on camera. I know it. But then the director comes over to me, the real director, and is like, look, do you want to be in this movie or do you want to be in the front row? I go, I want to be in the movie. He's like, I'm going to put you right behind the girls. So I sat second row behind the girls. So during all of those scenes, you can see me. The, they had taken a still of us together. So we're at the fashion show. I'm right behind them. And they'd taken a still. That picture was in the New York Times. That picture was in the book about Sex and the City. So it was really cool. It just kept getting reproduced and reshown and reshown. So it was the best move. I was glad that I listened to him and sat where I was going. It was said to be in the movie. So they looked out for me, which was really cool, uh, I have to say. So that was fun. But we were there until like 3 in the morning. And we're just sitting there and take after take after take. And Sarah Jessica Parker sure. was so cool because we're all like, gosh, we were so hungry. And she turns to us right. and she goes, I want some Kentucky Fried Chicken. And we all bust out laughing because it was really funny. <laughs> and we were like, yeah. So it was cool. They were very gracious, Aww. very nice. And they understood, too, that we were they were tired, too. We were tired, but that's, that's how it is. And they were trying to keep us right. from falling asleep. And, just, and I learned right. something, too. Um, there were so many extras in that movie, and a lot of them – 
looked, they had these outfits on, which was great and fun, like really mm-hmm. outrageous things. And I realized you can't really do that because you can never outshine the stars. So I thought that was kind of interesting because I think they all thought, I'll be in the movie if I wear this. And it's like, mm, you have to know what to, what to wear. When wardrobe works with you and stuff, it was, it was interesting. I thought that was kind of, kind of interesting to me. It's like, well, yeah, I just wore my leopard coat on in the movie. <laughs> but I think it's so funny. Now, whenever I get people all the time on the train, they'll be like, we saw you in the movie. Like, even now, it's funny that way. So it's cute. So it's good. So that was oh – and then the second never. movie – I was like, oh, I'm a shoe in because it's going to be in Morocco or right. Abu Dhabi, wherever they had said. So I'm like, I'm brown skin. Right. I've got this hair. So I get a whole right. outfit going there to the, you know, talking to the casting director. She's like, we'll put you in. This is perfect for you. I'm like, I'm going to Morocco. Come to find out the director <laughs> didn't want anyone that was in the first movie in the second movie. So unfortunately, oh. I was not in the second movie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, but see. whatever, you know, He's it like it Attractive, good hair, knows fashion, been in Sex in the City, so now she's a movie star. And then she wonders why I don't want to interview her. You're so yeah, funny. She's getting better by the minute. Extra. Yeah. You're funny. Yeah. So, oh, but thanks for asking. That's Ooh. fun. It's just, that's just something fun. Okay, cool. Yay. Oh, you bet. Okay, on to the next asset because okay. there's about yeah. 75 more. You suck. I love you, though. Um, Okay, so one of the really cool things is this. Okay, so this is almost like when you meet somebody in New York, and then the first time I met her, I already knew that there was going to be this instantaneous long-term connection. And then I start creeping on her to find out some of the stuff she loves. She loves Cher. I mean, Cher is like my number one person in the entire universe. Uh, I'm like, that's automatically kick-ass. She loves the artist, Barefoot in the Park, Nashville, Lipstick Jungle. Oh, my God, where is Lipstick yes. Jungle? If you're listening right now, why is it not on TV right now? Where yes. do you go? Why is it gone? Yeah, I want to know. I think you should film with a lipstick jungle. That's what I think. Take your curvy girls and make a show. I'm telling like you. It's jungle. funny. I was, look, I was looking at Brooke Shields' um, Instagram, and she had a picture, which I re-grammed, and it said in, there, in, the, in the caption, it said talking about a reunion. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yes. I did not know yes. that. See, she's on the yes. scene. She's on flight once again. She's checking yes. it out. <laughs> and uh, this is a fun fact. You used to live in Cuba. I did not know that. So I why didn't... were you in Cuba? <laughs> I didn't live in Cuba. Facebook. Well, it I says lived in you Cuba. did. It says I know, you know, but Facebook. Facebook thinks I lived in Cuba. And this is before well, Cuba was so happy that I could go. What did you say? <laughs> Well, I thought that would be a great journal. I thought it would be a great journalistic I, question. So, Patty, yeah, you I did. Do it really is. That. But, but I've never but, lived there. But, yeah. but Facebook, I don't know why. For some reason, Facebook put me in Cuba. I've never put that. I lived in Cuba, but it came up, popped up on my queue that I lived in Cuba. So I was like, I'll go with that. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, okay, so we're funny. going with that. You kind of were in Cuba. <laughs> you looked at it on a globe. Does that count? I think it might. We'll just throw that out there. Okay, now you and I have a similarity, another similarity, meaning that you've done on-air work for a period of about three years or so, and obviously I'm on air now amongst other places. So talk to folks a little bit because I know what this experience is like and so do you, but when you did your on-air work, um, sometimes I I know people often say things like, oh, my God, that must make you so nerve-wracking when you have the camera right in front of you because we both have done red carpet interviews before. So talk about Mm -hmm. your experiences a little bit in terms of that. And I know that somebody said the other day they're talking about instituting like I like notebooks, literal notebooks or, or those handheld things on the red carpet. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious to get your take on that because I, of course, always use cue cards and now I just try to remember from memory. But talk about your on-air experience a little bit and, and did you ever get a bit of that stage fright? Because I, I could see where maybe you might have in the beginning. Well, when I did um, Rachel Ray show, I did a segment there um, about Curvy Girls. I did a couple segments with her. Um mm-hmm. No, I didn't. I didn't really get nervous. I was prepped so much by these awesome producers, so they got me ready mm-hmm. for it. Um, they told me okay. things like make sure that you say the takeaways, very important. There's a lot to remember in that respect. So they said if you don't say takeaways and if the audience doesn't learn anything, it's just going to look like two women talking, and you don't want that. You want it to be right. to be informed yeah, because all of a sudden it's just jibber-jabber. So... <laughs> And the thing was, when I first met Rachel, we clicked immediately, which was awesome. 
so they, I think sometimes the producers never know how the guest is going to be with the um, with the host and vice versa. Right. But there wasn't a problem. It was just it, auto, it was automatic, automatic with us. And so that right. was really cool, and she made me feel comfortable, so that was great. So it was just a lot to remember. It was very surreal. It went by so quickly because it was all this preparation. I remember they had called me on a Thursday, and they said, you know, Rachel looked at your – I had a website at that time – looked at your Curvy Girl right. Style website. Um, she, you know, was kind of interested. She read your bio. She was interested in me because I was embracing the whole Curvy thing. Um, would you like to come on on Tuesday? And it was a Thursday, and that was it. And I pitched some ideas. In wow. the meantime, I said, these are some segment ideas. Yeah. So what did I do? I called up all my girlfriends, all my curvy girlfriends, and I said, <laughs> chicks, you girls are going to be on Rachel with me. So the segment had all my girlfriends that were curvy, and then I just called up everyone I knew to get clothes. And then I learned something really valuable. I came super-duper prepared. And the producers mm-hmm. were telling me they appreciated that because they said sometimes guests come on and then the producers have to do all the work and you don't want to incur more work for them. So I came right. prepared because I thought that's what you should do anyway because uh, this is my segment. I'm like, quote, unquote, producing it too. This is what I think it show, you know, showing them what I, my best foot forward and what I thought would be best on camera, blah, 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 which was great. Right. So, yeah, that was a big learning experience and they – told me later they appreciated the fact that I came prepared. So they were telling me when I was on air with her the first time, they said, if she says on air we want to have you back, then you're in. And I'm like, oh, right. So she said it, and I was like, yes. So that was great. So they asked me to come back again. So then they said, if she says it again, then she's going to want you to be a buddy. That means that I would be a regular. So I was like, oh, yes. She said it again. So after the show, they're like, okay, we need some information from you. We want you to be a buddy. It was the end of the season. So I'm like, okay, the the information. And I went back home, and I sat there, and my phone never rang. This was another learning experience. It was before I had an agent. So I didn't know you have to have someone speaking for you because by the next season rolled around, a lot of the producers were gone, and some of them didn't know who I was. But gotcha. I know now, since I have an agent now, but I know now that if that comes up again, then I know, okay, talk to my agent, because you need a mouthpiece. The talent, talent can't speak for themselves. And that, maybe that's something, too, that you've started to, that you probably learned and you've experienced also. You kind of yeah. need someone to speak for you. Um, let them negotiate the business. You be the talent. So that was a good learning experience. Um, I've had a few experiences like that, but it's good because I learned, and now I, you know, you're savvier and you know. Uh, right. So we'll we'll see what the future brings. I'm hoping to do Rachel Ray again because, like I said, we clicked automatically, which was great and fun, and she's awesome. I loved her. And then I did Wendy Williams show, and that was, was another that was fun Wendy too. Williams. She was she was great. She was really cool, actually. And she looks like, like a Barbie her. doll. She looks exactly I know like a Barbie doll, and it's so like she's. That boom, and she's tall, and she has hair and lashes, and that was kind of cool because you're just kind of like, oh wow, <laughs> when you look at I know, her. Right? Yeah, so that was. I can imagine. Me. Yeah, so I'm not I, as um, pretty as Patty and others, so oh, I can't stop imagine. Oh, you! I get it. I understand you're, the Wendy oh Williams thing. Everybody's so beautiful. My God, you're crazy. Well, and the other thing is, uh-huh. what's interesting about TV talk shows now is, I think that they have kind of evolved a little bit. You know what I'm talking about in terms of mm-hmm. we have so much turnover in stars, the view, the talk, et cetera. You've got revolving hosts all the time, things like that, et cetera. You've mm-hmm. done multiple mediums, obviously. Like you've worked for MTV and you've worked for mm-hmm. some of these, you know, segments we're talking about. And then on the flip right. side of the fence, you've done work with magazines and publications. If somebody's listening in, I personally think, because I've tried this before and getting on television, Sometimes it's almost more difficult to get on a TV segment or a TV show than it is to do some of the other mediums. Has your experience been the same or no? Yeah, it, it, I was fortunate TV. enough that I have a lot of friends in the business, which is great. Um, but that doesn't mm-hmm. mean – I mean, nepotism can be a beautiful thing, but you still have to prove yourself. Uh, right. You definitely do. I think um, – especially if a lot of times people ask me, I would like to do this. I would tell them to intern. Especially for Fashion Week, I get this question a lot. When Fashion Week comes around, it's like, I want to work with designers. What should I do? I say, v- volunteer your time. People can always use a helping hand. 
So right. just uh, and I was a little bit like uh, when I went to work Fashion Week, I just showed up in a suit every day. Like I was uh, like on it. You just have to be persistent, be prepared, mm-hmm. persistent, and be prepared, and be positive. Truly. And just be ready to work and helping hand. No one's going to say no to something, quote, unquote, free. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, go in and, you know, say I'll do anything. And sometimes, and I've worked on a lot of production stuff, sometimes you are virtually making coffee, sweeping the floor. But everybody pitches in, just do it. Do it, get it done, and move on. I think that's that's valuable in that sense. So um, you've got to, like, prove yourself. Constantly, and now too, it's a different with this whole Instagram and influencers and stuff. It's a lot, right? Um, to take in, so you just have to be prepared. Oh, yeah. And even for influencers, I think too. I, I have some friends that work in television, and they say sometimes it's hard to book the influencers because they might not be trained in other areas. So I think that's right. really important. Get a get media training, get a media coach, so you're at the ready. That just makes you more valuable and longevity. You know, you want longevity. In any business you go in, you want longevity. Of course. Um, oh, of course. Yeah, I so think. I think, um, yeah, I've done I've done casting. I would do, I mean, on air, when I, had my, when I met my agent, when she went to sign me, I was like, I just want to be on television. And she said, Patty, you have to think broader. She goes, that's well and good, but you've got to think broader um, because mm-hmm. that's going to ensure your place in the industry. And I'm like, yeah. So now, and I'm, I've got some things on the horizon, which once all that um, comes to, is solidified, I'll come back on your show and talk about that. But um, right now <laughs> I've got some things in the, <laughs> I got some things in the works television wise. So we'll, yeah. we'll see, but um, the future looks bright, but yeah. And I think you have to be positive, always and optimistic. And anything you go into, you just have to because nobody wants a Debbie Downer, as it were. You know, it's just True. who wants that? Nobody wants to work with that. I agree. No one, uh, yeah. And it, it doesn't good. It's not good for your own self image. It's not good for your own your your insides. It's just not good for your heart. You know. So I think no matter what, remain optimistic and positive because um, everything. Everything has a silver lining. <laughs> oh, my gosh, I'm such a movie. I'm such a 1960s movie, Doris Day. I don't care. <laughs> I was just going to say, literally. She's like, literally, she could just go on and on and on creating her own little movie here, and I'll just kind of gleefully <laughs> sit over here and listen into all these words That's of wisdom. Funny. Now, you did bring up the target word, casting producer, so I have to ask you. Obviously, next uh, month I start shooting my first film. So this is the first time I'm actually casting people. So I thought oh, I would wow. ask the professional herself, Three things that you look for in the ideal person when you're casting them are what? Um, and those genuine. of you listening to, and who are actors, pay attention. Yes, they have to be genuine. They have to believe in okay. the project. They have to believe in their talent. I think that's so important. You have to. I just worked with a friend of mine, too, and he was casting for something. It was a musical. But some of the people came on, they were kind of showy. And I was like, they just go from, you know, casting showy, showy, showy. I look. I would look for sincerity in their eyes, since you've got to believe in it. And even if they don't technically believe in it, that's a part of acting. You got to make me believe that you believe in it, because that's just so important. You know, um, that was the one thing. The second thing, um, punctuality. <laughs> that is huge. Ah. Because if you're, I mean, I get, I especially in New York City, like if they say 15 minutes, everything's 15 minutes late, but. Right. Uh, if you're showing me your life for an audition, then what are you going to be like when it's when I hire you? And then we're you've got you know a timetable. So I really think punctuality is important. And the third thing would be uh, uh, talent. Really good but looking. I, oh, no, 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 nothing, no, no, no. It doesn't have to always do with looks. No, I agree. No, you know that. You know that doesn't. Yeah, that's not it. Because someone could look like, but have a charm about them that, or they, or they understand the part. Yeah, I think, I think that's so secondary. That's not even secondary. That's not even on the plate. I don't think. But the third thing is talent. But when I say talent, they have to have some some of the chops. Even if they've never done anything before, which I've met people that haven't, but they still there's something there. They have to have that. I guess they call it the it factor. Um, not being cliche, but yeah, the it factor. It's they've got something there, and it's not even 
about, like I said, not being, doesn't have to be trained, doesn't have to be, it's just something innate. Is that what you feel too? Sometimes when you meet an actor, you like, oh my gosh, she's got that, that it. That I I'm do. Looking for. That, and I think yeah. there's an immediate connection between material and magnetism, meaning that you can automatically think, I think to some degree, some actors are just drawn to particular roles. And I've seen that happen in certain particular films that I've judged myself because now that I do the judging thing, obviously mm-hmm. I just had the big festival. Yeah, that's right. We were missing okay. Patty on site at my film festival. I was I just know. in I... New York City. So sorry. I, missed I, that. I know. I can't I wait till the next time. Like so it's there. I'm yeah, so right. proud of you. That's be, amazing. I have to figure out if I'm doing that or not. That's a lot of work. And by the way, thank you, Patty Hughes. Patty on site was just another one of the many silent people in the background helping me out while I was having panic attacks and crying. So I can't Aww. thank her enough for that one. It's it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of competition in New York City, as you know. It's a little crazy when it comes to that. And I won't lie to you. I mean, doing a film is really scary. I mean, it, it, it's I believe very strongly, and it's, it, you'll like it because it's silent. It's it's basically silent. Mm-hmm. It's 100 words. It's black and white. Wow, so it's being beautiful. done in the classic Hollywood type thing. So you're really going to enjoy something like that. Ooh, nice. But I figured I would ask you about that because you're the queen of those sorts of things. And, of course, more importantly, as if she hasn't done enough already, right? Because I've already got, like, no confidence left while I'm talking to her. Oh. But she also performs editing capacities at places like 17 and girl magazine so i want to talk a bit about the art of writing because that's really where my big strong suit is, is is writing itself so when you're putting something together for compilation a lot of the people that listen to my show are either future writers or current writers or writers beating their head against the wall trying to get somewhere mm-hmm. when we talk about the love of the english language which i have a huge love of my question mm-hmm. to you is when you're working and writing things whether it's a blog whether it's an article you name it what are some of the common things that you think people should avoid? You know, because I always talk about don't have diarrhea of the mouth, meaning like if you're going right. on and on and on and on and on, you know, that's a big faux pas. But is there something that you see consistently in the industry that you would say, hey, you know what, writers be rare, writers stay away from this? And, of course, the obvious, does Patty ever get writer's block? Because I feel like I'm the only one. Yeah, Ever. no, I write for Diva Gals Daily. I have my signature patty on site column with divagalsdaily.com. Right. And um, fashion writing's a little bit different. You've got to be descriptive. Um, you have to make, for me, I feel you have got to make the person feel like a certain restaurant, that they're right beside you in that restaurant. And if they're not, they want to go right there tomorrow. Um, you've got right. to really um, embrace them into the topic, even if it's a pair of shoes. You've got to like them feel like, I'm wearing those shoes or I've got to wear those shoes. Uh, right. I think uh, the biggest thing too is not to be too, for me, which I, from my opinion, when it comes to fashion writing, uh, don't in any writing, don't be too trendy in your speech. Not too many slang words okay. because you that's not going to. I just think the written word should be there forever, and you could go back in ten years and read it and not let it lose any of its. I, I just I just love that. Um, not lose any of its powerful impact because there's a word that you never even heard of, or it's to try not 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 have heard of because I do like words that come from the 18th century. I do love invoking that. I think that's really kind of cool. But it's trendy and fatty words. I think sometimes that can get a little too muddled and not make sense. Okay. Um, that, and that's my opinion, because, like, uh, for instance, like, the word bad meant good at one point, but then that doesn't, for the written word, that doesn't really work. See what I'm saying? Does that right. make sense? It does that's make what sense I think. to me. I, I, yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. I, I just think that's kind of important. Um, the other thing is, too, which I always, you have to have a proofreader, because when, I, when I'll be writing about something and I get all involved in it, you I'm like, oh, I miss that typo. Oh, I miss that. You need to, the best writers have um, proofreaders. You have to, and you have to have an editor that kind of goes with you, even if it's a friend who uh, someone else to look at it and say, oh, this might sound better this way because you need a, a, another set of eyes on your written piece. Do you feel that way too? True. Yeah, one hundred percent. I also think I think, and we've been writing for a while now. So I don't know if you look at it the same way, but I hate to admit it, and I don't know if it's an age thing. But when you get to a certain part in your career, I just have a hard time with editors sometimes. Maybe it's just because mm-hmm. I just, you know, I critique my stuff so much it's insane. So then by the time mm-hmm. it gets to somebody else, I probably picked it apart too much. So then when they mm-hmm. say, like, the littlest things, sometimes I'm like, oh, my God, I suck as a writer. And they're like, no, it's just that this yeah, is it. No. You know what I mean? I'm a little right. touchy on the whole, please don't touch my work. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I realize right. I'm perfect. We're not all patty on site. 
Oh, did yeah. I just say that again? <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, for the ease of time. And she's laughing at me again. See, she hates you're me. Because so. you're funny. <laughs> you make me laugh. Funny you're looking. So sweet. Funny no, looking. No. Sister. That's what I'm saying. They, are, they can't oh see me. Gosh. See, I'm behind the camera right now. So it's like you're nobody so can see me and I'm in my pajamas. No, I love that. Talk, so am I. Well, thank you. <laughs> pajamas, see, but in the pajamas. Awesome. You, love, you love our job. We get to work it's in pajamas, true. folks. How many of you can yeah. say that you're working it's in pajamas good. right now? It's well, good. at least I've been talking for almost two hours. Patty hasn't. But she crammed yeah, a oh. lot in at once. Notice that? She's so really funny. good at that. I mean, she could, like, get her point in three seconds flat. Now, before oh. we go to the obvious, which is the curvy stuff, I want to bring yeah. this up because you used to be the senior vice president of, president of programming for Style TV. A lot of my friends are currently working on if they're not already submitting pitches for TV series or other sorts of things. Any words of advice in terms of um, helpful hint as far as to get the attention of a programming head anywhere, whether it's TV, whether it's film, et cetera? What are those kinds of folks looking for? What should we be meticulous about when we're putting into our pitches? Um, and me, too. I'm, I also pitch. Um, I think it gets simple, 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 simple. If you need to draw them a picture, draw them a picture. Just keep it as simple as possible. Um, you have to remember, too, sometimes an idea you might think might be really great. That doesn't mean everyone's going to think it's great. So you need to really fine-tune it um, and just okay. keep it short and sweet. And draw them a picture. If you need to draw them a picture, draw them a picture. A lot of times, too, you might say something like, um, you know, say, like, Sex and the City meets, Star Wars, like, do you know what I'm saying? If you can, so that way yeah. they get a visual, which would be crazy, but they get a visual in their mind of what your project would look like. Does that make sense? So, because yeah, I think people, some, you got to draw them a picture. But a good friend of mine, too, that works in the business, and she's a makeup, a celebrity makeup artist, and she'll say that all the time, because she said that people will come to her and go, I want curly hair. And to her, does that mean wavy? Because some people, curly means wavy. <laughs> So it's a lot. Right. So it's kind of like that. So she said that's constantly. So sometimes you got to draw them a picture and just keep it simple in the pitches. I think um, in today's market too, they're looking for something different. That's the other thing. Something different. Something empowering. Something good right. TV. Good things that are good for human nature. Um, heart wrenching. But and then in a good way. I think that's really. That's my opinion. That's where I think every. It's all going. Um, yeah, I really think so because we, we've seen the reality of TV. We've seen these ladies fighting. We've seen this fight, blah, blah, blah. We've seen competition, blah, blah, blah. Like now let's look at, which we all need right now, let's look at some good heartfelt programming and ideas and Amen movies. That. And, yeah, so I think. I bet. Um, you bet. And too, and movies that tell a good story too, I think that's important. A nonfiction, very important. And I know with your works, there's a lot of that too. Um, it is. The, the true story is very, it's very important, especially in the today's climate. I think, um, and heroines, we need more heroines and strong women. And, oh, I just love all, because look at what Wonder Woman did. Unbelievable what right? that movie oh did. And, 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 her, and she's amazing, the actress. And she yes. invokes all of that powerful empowerment woman, because it's all about women. We're just. Wow, it's just such our time. I think it was always our time, but, man, it's really our time. I think it was our time in the 70s. No matter what era, I think it's still us. It's so funny, too. I was watching, because um, I love old movies and old TV, so I was watching Donna Reed show, which was like, I don't know, 1952 oh, yeah. or something. She was yeah. such a feminist. I had no idea. And I was like, look at her. In every episode, she's, you know, subtly in her own special way ends up telling somebody off. Like, there's the whole one about they were saying, you're just a housewife, just a housewife, and that was it. You couldn't even say that to her. So it was really interesting. So sure. I think even women in their 50s, in the, I'm sorry, in the 50s, had a certain leadership, shall I say, and exactly. feminist quality. They weren't just housewives. They were smart. Even Lucy was smart and clever and it's just really i love women and girls and and it's I very know. important too for young girls to see positive images it's just so like that movie hidden figures like who knew this existed a beautiful story right i, I know. think all of it's so important um so a good heroine if if you can if that's you know i think that's really what they're looking for in my opinion 
<laughs> I agree. I do agree. Yeah. Isn't she wonderful? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, now, I don't fun. want to forget to get to this very last part because this sucks yes. that we don't have two hours. We only have one hour. So we want to talk yes. about, of course, Curvy Caravan. We want to talk about, yes. since you're the creator of that, which is a production and event company, so you're going to tell everybody what Curvy Caravan is. Yes. And, of course, you have the two events, one on February 1st, one on March 5th, both in 2018. Right. Talk to the folks about what Curvy Caravan is and what you're offering for these events. Sure. So um, Curvy Caravan is going to be in Times Square, because I'm working with the Times Square Alliance in New York City, which is awesome. They're right. like, have it here. And I'm like, okay, cool. Um, we're looking at, actually, the dates might change a little bit. Um, we're just looking at, I'm looking okay. at the most, the best dates possible. And I'll, I can update, I'll update everyone. You know, anyone can email me if they want to know more about this too, patty at curvycaravan.com. Um, Because we're actively looking for um, sponsorships and we're looking for vendors and all that. But anyway, so um, so Curvy Caravan, and that is the name of my company also. What it's going to be, which is very cool, it's going to be an actual um, campsite in front of a style truck. It's called Style Haven, which is this amazing style truck, which is like a store on wheels which is the coolest thing ever. Um, she's actually one of my sponsors, um, Corinne. And like I said, you can email me to find out more information. But her style um, haven is a full-service mobile boutique specialized in unique and affordable women's clothing, accessories and gifts, very vintage. The style truck can also be rented out, which is really something really cool um, for private parties and stuff, So, which I love that. I've gone to – see, I'm going off track, but I need to say this anyway, because I've gone to a wedding, and I went to a party, a home party, and they had food trucks come, which is really smart to do. I said, any party I give is going to have a food truck, right? So to me, why not have a style truck come to your house and have all your girlfriends and then go shopping? In your driveway, basically. So that's so cool. So Style Haven, that's the style truck. She's going to be the backdrop to this mock campsite glamping that we're going to have in front of the truck in Times Square. I'm all about camping. I'm not all about camping. Excuse me. I'm not about camping. But glamping, that's a whole other story. Growing up, too, we'd always go camping. I'm like, camping? Oh, But glamping? So we're going to have a camping glamping is going to be in the front of the truck. Makes sense? Then we're going to have an audience. Yes. We're going to do fun games. We're going to do a little fun fashion show. We're going to do fun giveaways. It's going to be awesome. So much fun. Um, Times Square Alliance has been great. They're like, don't worry, Patty. You know, we can make it a private event. You know, because I just <laughs> – I don't want everyone – every – Poor bomb in New York City, like, coming on <laughs> right under my campsite sleeping. But it will all be um, very much organized in that sense that we're going to have a live audience. Sure. We're going to do fun games. It's going to be so much fun. I can't wait for that. Um, I've had, too, I've had some media outlets already keep asking me, when is it? We want to cover it. We want to be there. We want to be there. It's, like, so exciting. Right. Uh, so that's going to be great. I'm also working with an audience coordinator, which is going to be really kind of cool. This is my TV thing coming in. So we have the right audience there. So all of our vendors and our sponsors will be reaching the right, their key market audience, which I think is pretty cool. Right. And we're going to be filming this. So we'll be streaming oh it, and God. it might end up on a television station near you. So excited about that. So that's Curvy Caravan. The other event that I'm doing is called Ladies' Choice. And what that's going to be, it's going to be – Think of it as a talk show meets a trade show meets an event. So I'm going to be in front of a live audience, a talk show basically, and we're going to have different segments. So it's all about women empowerment and girl empowerment. And the sponsors and the vendors that I'm looking for are all going to be women-owned businesses, which I think is going to be cool. Huh? I'm going to have an all-girl band. It's going to be my house band. Then during the oh, break, cool. yeah, is that cool? So, um, and I think I'm going to do like a, I think I'm going to do a big search for this group. For I want to discover a brand new girl group. I think that would be really cool. So, I, that's another show. So, I want to have auditions and and just and tape everything and video everything. I think that's going to be fun. And then let the audience decide. Oh, I can't wait. So I'm going to have an all-girl band. It's my house band. And then we're going to do different segments. We're going to have segments about food and wellness and um, fashion. It's a really cool fashion show. It's going to be kind of innovative. Um, oh even 
yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be just like a regular talk show that you watch on television with the different segments. Then during the um, breaks, the audience will be able to go to different vignettes we're going to have set up. And it'll be like they're walking gotcha. into a room, like a meditation garden. Then I'm going to have like a beauty salon. And I'll have, like, um, a wedding reception. So in those different vignettes, there's just going to be different vendors. And then the people can shop, which is great. So all the people coming to the event will be able to shop. And then I'm going to have a section for all new um, vendors, which I think is really good. Because I've talked to some businesses that are just starting out. They're like, we want to start out. We just want to market ourselves the right way. I'm like, this is perfect because you're going to reach the audience directly, which I think is awesome. You don't have to, you know, it's just so simple. Your audience is right there in front of you. So they're able to sell their goods, which I think is cool. And my style truck is going to be there. It's going to be in the venue, which is going to be great. This truck inside the venue, it's going to be so cool. And then be able to shop there too, which I think is going to be really great. And then the designers I'm using – Vivian Pash, which is an awesome designer, and like I said, if people email me, I can send you more information. She's so freaking cool. She's written up in British Vogue. Her stuff has, like, its little 60s sensibility and then modern. Mm-hmm. It's just really cool. And an Academy Award winner, which I forgot the name, but has had won the Academy Award wearing her dress. And she didn't even know because the stylist pulled the dress and ended up on this Academy Award winner. It was, I mean, that is just oh a designer's dream. So she's right. one of my designers, and what she's doing, which is really kind of cool, this is also um, for Christmas and holidays, is she will work with a client to create an outfit with them, a dress or a jumpsuit, which I think is kind of really neat. How, like you, you buy into it, but what a great gift is that? So say your sister's like, oh, oh I have a dress or a blah, blah. Well, here's a coupon um, discount card and work with Vivian to create – an awesome outfit. I mean, who can work with a, a designer that closely? She does it for oh my God. men and ki- men, women and kids. How cute is that? So my whole thing is, you could have a mom come in with her little daughter, and Vivian will create an outfit for both of them. How cute oh my God, is this that? Is so cute. Okay, yeah, now I have to stop you because we're down to the last two minutes here. So this is what we're ah. going to do. You're going to come back okay. to my show before 2018 okay. and promote this. I want to squeeze okay. in all the different ways for people to find you. Obviously, okay. her name is Patty Hughes, a.k.a. Patty on site. I'll read off the list here. The website is uh, divaangelsdaily.com. Yeah, divaangelsdaily.com. Yep. That's right. She is on Pinterest. Yeah. Her Twitter and Instagram are both her name, which is Patty Hughes. She's yep. also on Tumblr. She has an IMDb profile. She's on yep. LinkedIn. And she also has her Facebook personal page as well. Any yep. other place where somebody can find you? No, that's good. They can find, they can email me directly at patty at um, right. curvycaravan.com. Yes, and I wanted to talk, oh, we're also working with um, this great wellness center, because it's about wellness, too, which I wanted to get into, but I have to come back. See, but is, I'm all about the curvy, I mean. but we've we got to remember too. wellness and healthy and healthy and healthy and healthy. <laughs> oh, but I work agree. with this great, um, this great, uh, it's, it's all about Provence in France, and it's a wellness center, and it's pretty darn cool. So that's the other, they just oh, signed awesome. on with us, and I'm so excited. So, you know, I, Email me, please. I'll send you more information. I definitely want to come back and talk about this more because we kept talking and talking. You have to come back. You were right, and we just keep talking. So it's like we Uh, could do a two-hour show. So you'll come back in 2018. I'll post up what I think of you after the show because now I don't have time to tell you what I think of you, but I will give you your surprise before I forget because everybody gets a surprise. Oh, cut it out. I will publicly (laughs) post what I think of you in case you didn't already know. And hopefully I'll get an invitation to one, if not both of these events, because I would hate to miss the party of the year. But the one surprise that I wanted to offer you besides I have an idea of one of the women who could be in your band is I was wondering if the pet might Oh, look at this. They're cutting us to 90 seconds. So very quickly, I just don't want to forget to say that I cannot film Love's Two-Way Mirror, my new movie, unless Patty Hughes decides that she'll do a wee bit part in there. Pretty cool. Oh, my gosh. I would love it. Are you kidding me? Ah, She just said yes. Oh, my God. Yes. She just said yes, and it's live. Oh, my God. Okay, so now we're down to, like, 60 seconds. So all I want to say is I love you. I'll reach out afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. You can come back next year. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, get off my show now. i got to wrap it up, honey. (laughs) Bye. Weren't they lovely? One more time. Obviously, the Patty Hughes, a.k.a. Patty on site. Facebook personal page, LinkedIn, IMDb, her Instagram and Twitter, at Patty Hughes, Tumblr, 
Pinterest, and the website is DivaAngelsDaily.com. Both my big thanks to both Patty Hughes as well as to John LaFaber, along with Antonio Hall for booking this. Thanks so much to listening in for my two-hour program. Tomorrow, 1230 Central Standard Time, The Margaret Joseph's Real Housewives of New Jersey. I almost forgot about that. We'll talk to you guys at 1230 tomorrow. Feel free to send me comments or questions for Margaret. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Take care. Target Red Card now has new benefits you'll love. Save 5% every day, plus get exclusive extras. Apply for a Red Card debit or credit card now and save on, saver. Some restrictions apply. Visit Target.com slash Red Card for Red Card program rules. Target Red Card now has new benefits you'll love. Save 5% every day, plus get exclusive extras. Apply for a Red Card debit or credit card now and save on, saver. Some restrictions apply. Visit Target.com slash Red Card for Red Card program rules.